On June 1, 2017, the recent review score for Europa Universalis dropped below 50%. This marked the first time the game had fallen into the mixed category, marking a sharp decline from what its past score had been. A game once widely lauded by its fans was now under attack by a barrage of criticisms related to its pricing structure and DLC model. Many of these criticisms came from people with hundreds, even thousands of hours invested in the game. At the time of this video, the recent reviews stand at just 27% positive and are flirting with the overwhelmingly negative territory. There had always been rumblings of discontent with Paradox's DLC model, but now it appeared that things were reaching a breaking point, with the threat of an open revolt looming. How did we get here? Hello viewers, my name's Riemann, and today I want to talk about Paradox's DLC model. While I'm making this video specifically for EU4, which has taken the brunt of the criticism, it generally applies to all of Paradox's games. In this video, I'll discuss the price increase that sparked the latest round of criticism, how the DLC model is actually good in some ways, how it fails in many other ways, and my suggestion for how to fix it so that Paradox can keep the goodwill of its fans while making enough money to continue supporting and expanding its amazing games. It's clear from the recent uproar that Paradox's DLC model is not the most popular decision they've ever made. However, not all of the uproar is just related to DLC. The catalyst for the recent wave of discontent was actually from a decision Paradox made to increase its prices in many regions that weren't the USA or Western Europe. A post by a forum manager reveals their decision-making process on the issue, being primarily focused on relative purchasing power and currency conversion rates. The way purchasing power was used in this statement has led to many people misunderstanding the reason for the price increase. As an example, Mandate of Heaven costs 20 US dollars. For Russia, it used to cost 419 rubles, equivalent to 725 USD, and it was increased to 699 rubles, equivalent to 12 USD. Clearly, they took purchasing power into account, which is why people in Russia are still only paying 60% of what people in the US are. The reason for the price increase in many countries is how their currencies have depreciated significantly over the past few years. I understand that no one is ever happy with price increases, but that doesn't mean Paradox should eternally be locked into years-old currency exchange rates. These changes didn't happen because Paradox felt that certain regions had been getting richer and could now afford to pay more for DLC. They happened because the currency exchange rates had shifted and Paradox readjusted their prices to reflect this. They could have potentially handled it better by either announcing it a few weeks ahead of time or by not doing it before Steam's summer sale when many people had been waiting for a discount. However, many game companies adjust to changing exchange rates, as do firms in other industries. It's a ubiquitous fact of international trade, and thus I feel Paradox was justified, even though they ended up reversing the decision as I was writing the script. With that being said though, the uproar has reignited an interesting debate on whether the DLC Paradox releases is worth its price. The question of value paid for features provided is one with no right answer. Is Third Rome worth 10 bucks? On one hand, Russia is now more of a presence in every game, but on the other hand it adds but a handful of features to only a small group of nations. On one hand, you could look at it as paying $10 for what could amount to hundreds of hours of gameplay, while on the other hand, Oblivion also had hundreds of hours of gameplay, but it was rightly ridiculed when Bethesda charged $250 for horse armor. You can get tons of hours of enjoyment out of EU4's expansions, but for that $10 you could also buy a game like Undertale or FTL, which could provide so much more. Heck, are any of these comparisons even fair to use in arguments like these in the first place? Personally, I bought the expansion and think it's worth it for me because I know I'll get lots out of it, but I could easily see someone who doesn't want to play in Russia thinking 10 bucks is too big of an ask. Part of the price tag was the unit models Paradox normally would have sold separately in a content pack, but this time they were part of the base DLC, meaning there was about $6 worth of gameplay and $4 worth of cosmetics, which I think was a bit of a silly move to force the two together. But the issue of is DLC worth the price is not something I want to address today. It, like the price increase in many countries, is a side concern to the main issue of how Paradox should charge money for its new features in DLC. The DLC model Paradox uses actually came as an evolution of their previous policy. Back in EU3, the MO was to release expansions like the DLCs of today with one important difference. They were mandatory. If you wanted to continue receiving support in the form of new patches and bug fixes, you had to get the expansion. This also meant that newer expansions required every other expansion as well. There was no picking and choosing, it was a take it or leave it situation. 
But with the EU4, that system was changed to the modern DLC system where you can buy the ones you want and leave the others. Even if you don't buy any of them, you'll still be able to get patches and bug fixes and new features. But the biggest, most obvious benefit of having this sort of development cycle is that we get the game with the most meaningful depth of any grand strategy title ever made. Even flagships like Civilization pale in comparison to the depth EU4 has to offer, especially in terms of things like diplomacy. Johan recently took to the forums and expounded a bit on this, laying out a clear scenario of what EU4 would have looked like under the old system. Continually paying Paradox is the only way we can get a game as advanced as this, and that's a huge benefit that should be preserved. However, no matter how great the game we get is, it is undeniable the DLC model has problems. As I've read through community feedback and taken my own opinion into account, I've come up with seven distinct issues the policy has created. Some of them are big and obvious, while some of them are only apparent from a long-term analysis of the game mechanics. I'll briefly summarize them all. Number one, some DLCs aren't really optional. So this one has been hotly debated on both sides, with some people saying the game is perfectly playable with no DLCs, and others saying it's completely unplayable without all of them. From my experience, the true answer lies somewhere in the middle. For sure, the game is absolutely technically playable without any of the DLCs, but you'll be getting a vastly cut down experience, and more importantly, the base game is actually regressing to a worse and worse state as time goes on. The example everyone likes to give of this is development and institutions. It used to be that you could conquer a single OPM in Europe and westernize off that, but with the institutions, that's no longer possible. You'd have to conquer a large swath of land so it would be 10% of your development, which is much more difficult and might not be feasible for a backwards country. To remedy this, Paradox included the ability to generate institutions by developing provinces, something that's become the de facto method people use in most games. But this is locked behind the $15 Common Sense expansion, effectively making it much harder for the rest of the world to get on an even keel with the West if you haven't ponied up for the DLC. But it goes further than this. Liberty Desire and Colonial Nations have been forced on us through mandatory patches, but development is simply one of the best ways of dealing with rebellious colonies. That 5% stacking bonus means you can run them at 100% tariffs with no fears of them revolting, and you'll end up earning an order of magnitude more ducats from them. If you don't develop, you could find yourself in frequent independence wars if you so much as have high absolutism and mercantilism. Moreover, building slots used to be standardized across all provinces, but a mandatory patch changed it to be based on development, which, again, can only be raised if you have common sense. And while development is the most obvious example of shifting game balance due to DLC, it's hardly the only one. There used to be buildings each nation could have one of that gave bonuses like an extra diplomat, leader upkeep, army tradition, and legitimacy. These were patched out and effectually replaced with premium DLC features like estates, government ranks, and strengthening the throne. Support independence is basically mandatory now if you want to play as a vassal from how they've changed subject mechanics. They forced new and much more annoying espionage into the base game, but counter espionage is a DLC feature. If you have the Cossacks expansion, you'll know that promising land to allies is one of the best ways of calling them into wars, but you can only give them land if they occupy it, and the only non-awkward way of doing this, transferring occupation, is once again a DLC feature from Art of War. There are tons of additional examples like this you can find if you just look closely enough. I also don't think the argument of just roll back to an earlier patch is really fair, because not only are people missing out on the content from free patches, they're also missing out on essential bug fixes, and finding mods is going to be almost impossible, shooting themselves in the foot three times just to get back to square one, and preventing them from using any DLCs they wanted to use if they were released after a patch which demolished vanilla gameplay in a way odious enough for them to want to revert to an earlier version. The game simply isn't balanced if you're not using some of the more critical DLCs, which leads me to... Number 2. Having thousands of DLC combinations saps QA time and makes the game more buggy and unbalanced. EU3 used to have an option for how aggressive the AI would be, allowing players to tailor the type of game they wanted. I'm a big fan of more options, but eventually it was removed, and whenever I or anyone else posts on the forum questioning where it went or suggesting other options, the response is always the same. Having more optional configurations exponentially increases QA time. In particular, they've specifically mentioned that increasing combinations is the primary factor. But while they've used this logic to explain away options, it also applies to DLCs. As of the release of Third Rome, there are 2,048 possible combinations of DLCs people could have. That's an astronomical amount, and it's impossible to fully test. While it might be somewhat easier to test things you can just turn on and off, there's no telling how many bugs this has still caused, and the gameplay balance issues are already apparent. 
This is only going to get worse and worse at a faster pace with each new DLC. Number 3. The perceived value of DLCs is diminished through hodgepodging of content. Earlier in the video, I said there was no right answer to what the intrinsic value of a DLC was, and whether any particular price point was fair or not. However, I'm much more sympathetic to arguments claiming DLCs are overpriced because they're stuffed with features people don't necessarily want. Take Common Sense for example. Most people list it as an essential DLC because of its main feature, the ability to develop provinces. But that alone doesn't justify its $15 price tag. The reason it costs so much is that it's littered with a whole bunch of extra stuff, like more in-depth theocracies, parliaments for constitutional monarchies, Protestant church power, and Buddhist karma. But if a customer didn't want to pay for any of those extras, they're out of luck because that's the way the DLC has been arbitrarily structured. The Europa Universalis dev team has been guilty of unfocused expansions at least since EU3. Features are simply not packaged in any semblance of how players might be interested in them. They're thrown together seemingly at random, with a price tag affixed based on how many of them landed in the bucket before the code freeze date. Take Rights of Man as another example. The promotional picture is of Frederick the Great of Prussia, and while there is more flavor in the form of a special Prussian monarchy, once again it's but a single feature in a DLC that includes Ottoman government changes, ruler traits, disinheriting, great power mechanics, more military instructions to subjects, revolutionary factions, and expanded Coptic and fetishist religions. I had been hoping things were moving in the right direction with Third Rome being an immersion pack that was tightly focused on Russia, but again, they mishandled this by making the cosmetics inseparable from the game mechanics and swathing both in a $10 price tag. Number 4. The number and nature of DLCs causes confusion on many levels. Unfocused DLCs are a major factor in this. On nearly all the videos I make, I get people asking, what DLCs do I need to do this? This should not be nearly as common of a question as it is, and I think properly packaging DLCs and giving them clear indicative names would help a lot in that area. But that's hardly the only way DLCs are confusing. One look at the Steam page shows dozens of different things you can buy, but the problem is there's no real indication for how necessary they all are. Many of them have confusing names, with content packs sounding like they might contain extra missions or events when they're actually just cosmetics, while the new immersion pack sounds like it would just add unit models when it's actually an expansion with a smaller scope. Moreover, there's a woeful lack of a gameplay bundle that has all expansions. The only bundles that exist are ones that have a whole bunch of cosmetics, which could be worth it if you love the game, but otherwise just jack up the price. And of course, there's no telling which expansions are the most useful except by searching out specific articles or Reddit posts that deal with the subject, something that's become almost necessary for new players. Which leads me to… Number 5. A wall of DLCs creates a huge barrier of entry for new players. This is the criticism that personally hits me the hardest. I've seen it happen a few times with some of my friends I've tried to introduce to the game. All of Paradox's titles feature obscene learning curves in of themselves, and adding an extra layer where it's difficult to even know what to purchase just complicates things further. It's impossible to tell how many people have been turned off by this alone, but it's clear it's having a pervasive impact. One of the first things you'll see on the EU4 Steam page is this little chestnut, the cost of buying all DLC and an exorbitant price right beside it. Anyone who's played the game for any significant length of time could tell you that's definitely not the actual price of entry into the game. You wouldn't buy the cosmetics or the music or the ebooks, you could skip half the DLCs to start and for the rest you'd wait for a sale to get them half off. Which is why it is so frustrating when everywhere I go I see people saying EU4 costs $200 to play. That's a silly thing to say, but from how common this phrase is points to a big problem with information asymmetry, in that a new player could come to the same erroneous conclusion prima facie. And it leads to another problem in that for it not to be true, any new customers will have to wait for a sale. Paradox has bucked the trend of almost every other major game company in that it steadfastly refuses to lower the prices on its games or DLCs for years after they're released. It lowers them a bit when a sequel is released, but it's crazy that the baseline for Art of War is still the same $20 almost three years later. This makes it so new players will only want to buy the game at the random times of sales, making it awkward to recommend to them because you'll always have to include the caveat of wait for a discount. Forcing the can to be kicked down the road like this is a terrible business strategy. It significantly increases the likelihood that they'll forget about it when a sale finally does roll around, making it so they don't even give the game a chance. Number 6. Optional DLC forces mechanics to exist in isolation. Earlier I had discussed what happens when mechanics don't exist in isolation. You get things like development being far too important in terms of institutions, subjects, and building slots to have a balanced game without them. 
The proper way to do DLC features then is to have mechanics exist in isolation, with their own requirements, penalties, and bonuses that are completely endogenous to themselves alone. This works fine for many things, especially regional or country-specific mechanics like the Prussian monarchy, but in other instances it feels weirdly out of place. Case in point, estates. It's a mechanic every nation has access to, with its own rewards and penalties and a little minigame that feels completely and utterly divorced from everything else that happens in the game. The only way they affect anything outside of themselves is through the bonuses and penalties that get spit out of them. Mechanically, they have no interaction with diplomacy, trade, or military conflict. The devs could have inserted a game of Galaga you played every 20 years, and if it had the same rewards, it would feel about as connected to everything as estates do. And this is a bit tragic because there's so many obvious ways estates could interact with other game mechanics to add to the overall experience and open up new ways of playing. The devs themselves have even said they screwed up on estates, but they certainly couldn't go backwards and say we're removing the feature until it improves up to our standards because it's not a part of the base game. They'd face a huge amount of backlash if they significantly reduced a feature people paid money for. Nor could they really go forwards because if they started integrating it more in a rework, they'd have to tread very lightly to not make it too important and cause another uproar like what's happening with development. By putting the feature in a DLC, they creatively straightjacketed themselves because they have to balance for people who did purchase and for people who didn't purchase. This should show that the current DLC policy harms not only potential new customers and people with financial difficulties, but also players who can't afford to buy everything and who are just looking for good, compelling, integrated game mechanics with meaningful depth. Finally, number 7. The current DLC policy poisons goodwill. It's easy to underestimate the effect a community's opinion has on a company because there's no readily measurable impact on the bottom line, and it's all too easy to point to a corporation like Electronic Arts and say, they're doing fine and everyone hates them. The community has started to settle down with the announcement that Paradox is reverting the price changes to many countries, but if they choose to ignore the fundamental issues of the current DLC system, they do so at their peril. Goodwill makes people willing to buy expensive unit packs that are basically tips. It makes people more willing to mod games and share stuff with the community. It affects word of mouth advertising and a whole bunch of other things. Basically, they have a choice to be seen by the larger community either as the good guy who makes deep games no one else will, or they can be seen as the bad guy that uses its effective monopoly on grand strategy to ransom its content for exorbitant prices. Now, while it's quite easy to point out the flaws of something, it's quite a bit harder to make a workable solution. I posted a thread on the forums asking what changes people would make, and it was pretty crazy to see the level of differences in the suggestions. There were propositions that ranged from a subscription model where you paid $1 per hour played, to completely invalidating old DLCs after a period of time like Hearthstone, to effectively returning to the old model where all previous DLCs would be mandatory, to aggressive rebundling specifically oriented towards new players, to doing nothing at all. And of course, there were a whole bunch of people just saying, decrease the price. And they weren't talking about the price hike, they were just saying that, generally, the prices should come down by a significant margin. Getting more for less is something every customer would like, but it's pretty useless as a suggestion because Paradox needs to remain profitable, so simply reducing prices doesn't stand up well as a business case. So after studying what people have proposed and thinking about it for a while, I came up with the following plan. It's pretty radical, but I think we're at the point where radical solutions are needed. I'll explain all the broad strokes first, then go into more detailed explanations of each part afterwards. So, the plan. Have any new global gameplay mechanics be in their own unique DLCs where they're separated from other things like regional flavor and cosmetics. Then have these DLCs be integrated into the base game after some period of time. For example, one year, 18 months, after four more DLCs have been released, whatever. Finally, ensure good and open communication with the community about how you're enacting this change and other business decisions. Now let's break it down bit by bit. The first part of having global gameplay mechanics be in their own package is something I think Paradox should do regardless of if they follow the rest of the plan. It's more along the line of how people would want to buy things, which would improve customers' perceived cost-to-feature ratio of the DLCs. Now what do I mean by global gameplay mechanics? Well, I went through the features list of all DLCs, and here's how it would break down if Paradox had been using the system from the beginning. There are some that I was a little unsure of which group they belong to, but for the most part, things were cut and dry. Then, instead of cutting their DLCs how they do today where it's horizontal, they'd cut it vertically, which would look something like this. Obviously, they'd want to have the DLCs have a particular focus, as I stated before, but this should at least give an idea of the structure I think would be optimal, with the same features and same amount of DLCs just moved around a bit. Then, the global gameplay mechanic ones would be integrated with the base game after some period of time. 
The exact length of time would be decided by Paradox based on what they think is best, but I'd say somewhere between 6 months and 24 months would be the sweet spot. I'm hardly the first person to suggest merging DLCs with the base game, but most of the suggestions I've seen haven't paired it with a reorganization of the DLC structure. Many people want all DLC features merged, and I think that goes a bit too far because at the end of the day, this would be a business decision on Paradox's part. When people complain about things like common sense, they're complaining about province development being locked behind a paywall. I've never seen someone complain that they had to pay for parliaments or Buddhist karma. Hence, I think this would be the best compromise between free and premium Paradox could make. It's global gameplay mechanics, big and small, that primarily cause problems. Finally, you might think the last part of having good communication is a fluff statement, but as recent events have shown, it's something we're in need of. Paradox is usually great with communication with things like dev diaries and forum posts by team members, but communication in regards to business decisions has been lacking, with it taking many days for the pricing situation to blow up in their faces before the CEO made this statement and then reversed the decision. This is probably because the CEO is more removed from the day-to-day -day affairs of things than Jake or Johan are, but if he can't be on the forums all day, then he should empower someone to speak about business decisions on his behalf, explaining not only what's happening, but providing detailed explanations for why the company thinks these changes are necessary. Having good, clear communication goes a long way in mollifying people when you make unpopular moves. A change of policy on the scale I've proposed could either go really well, or it could cause confusion, anger, and resentment if the process is opaque. Again, this is something I think Paradox should do even if they don't follow my plan here, but it'd be especially useful if they decide to enact any major changes. Now this plan, if it were implemented, would pretty decisively solve all the issues I listed. It would remove the problem of non-optional game mechanics being forever locked behind a paywall, it would improve QA by reducing the total number of game variations, especially ones that don't exist in isolation which would be the biggest concern, repackaging DLCs would improve their perceived value and reduce confusion, it would reduce the barrier to entry, it would allow major mechanics to be integrated with each other to provide more meaningful depth, and it would remove much of the frustration the community has. I won't pretend the plan is perfect though. It could sometimes be hard to determine what exactly constitutes a global gameplay mechanic, and merging stuff with the base game will force players to use mechanics they might not want to be part of the game, although mods could easily take care of that. There's also the issue that people who bought the DLCs might feel miffed that others got them for free, but other games have gone down this route and it was almost a non-issue because most people just want a better game. I'm also not sure if the plan could even be done with an old game like EU4 because the implementation now on older DLCs would almost certainly get very messy. Maybe they could only do it going forward, or maybe they'd have to try it on a blank slate with their next release. But those concerns wouldn't prevent a determined company from enacting the plan. The only thing that would do that is the issue of financial solvency. I have no access to Paradox's financial data to tell whether this is feasible, but using the limited information available to me, I'll try to present the best case I can. The obvious concern would be that a significant portion of people wouldn't buy the DLCs anymore, they'd just wait it out until they got merged into the base game. But I don't think that would be nearly as large of a problem as some people have hypothesized. The best comparison I can make comes from another gaming product, Denuvo. Denuvo is an add-on to DRM so that games can't be pirated. The interesting point is how Denuvo advertises itself. It doesn't present itself as the solution to piracy, it merely says it, quote, protects the initial sales window. The vast majority of game sales come in just a few weeks after it's released. This happens to such a degree that major game companies are willing to bet thousands, even millions of dollars on the chance that their games will be unpiratable for just a few months. Even though Denuvo's been getting cracked faster and faster these days, it's becoming more and more common. The only reason companies pay for it is that for the vast majority of players, impatience is much more of a factor than stinginess. Comparing pirates to legitimate customers in this way is a bit of an apples to oranges comparison, but I do think it's mostly valid on this point. People want to have things now, so it's fair to say that the vast majority of customers that were buying DLCs before will still be willing to pay for the DLCs even if they do become free many months or years later. When you take into account this fact, along with attracting new players by the reduced barrier to entry, improved QA and balancing, and better unshackled game features, I think there's a very real possibility that the plan would be revenue neutral or even revenue positive in the long term. But I don't want to be needlessly utopian, so I've prepared a few other ways Paradox could increase revenue to offset any potential losses. First, they could increase the price of the standard game by a bit, either by upping the baseline or not putting it on sale as often. 
As long as this was part of a larger price restructuring and there was good communication, I think the community would be very understanding about this. The conversation would have already changed from you need the base game and two to four DLCs to actually play it properly to the base game is a standalone product for 50 or 60 bucks. The second way they could make more money is by reorienting the flavor DLCs to have a greater emphasis on designer work than on programmer work. One of the beauties of the Kloschwitz engine is that it minimizes programmer time for things like events, missions, and ideas. Paradox has said in the past that they price DLCs based on how much work it took to make them. The reason Mare Nostrum costs $15 is that they had to completely reprogram unit belligerency so it could keep track of two conflicts, not just one. And while there is a sense of fairness in pricing this way, I think this is also part of the reason why people say some DLC is too costly, because Condottieri usually don't feel super impactful. On the other hand, designer time is cheaper than programmer time, but it oftentimes feels just as impactful as new mechanics. Anyone who's played Kaiserreich from Hearts of Iron 4 has probably felt this. As a mod, the creators have no access to the source code, and they're not even doing it for money, and yet they've still managed to create an experience that feels much more fleshed out and lively than vanilla. Paradox could do tons of regional DLCs, events and mission packs, or larger goals like mending the Christian schism using primarily designers. This could lead to optional packs that felt fuller for their price point, and could even be made with a higher profit margin due to their emphasis on cheaper designer time over more expensive programmer time. I'm not saying don't have any new mechanics, I'm just saying there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that would be easy to make and people would be happy to purchase it at reasonable prices. Beyond this, there are a few more odious ways Paradox can make more money, but I'd say following one or both of these suggestions I listed should more than offset potential losses. The time has come for a major shakeup of how Paradox sells its DLCs. Given the problems the current policy has caused, I believe the plan of rolling global gameplay mechanics into the base game after a period of time is the best solution that balances fixing the issues of the old system while maintaining profitability. This isn't a call to get a whole bunch of stuff for free for no reason. It goes without saying that I'd still be purchasing every DLC day one, making it so this plan would not benefit me financially in the slightest. Rather, this video is a call for Paradox to take action to fix a pernicious stain on their games. This plan isn't perfect, but I believe if enacted it would benefit the customers, the programmers, the designers, and even the company's bottom line in the long term, ensuring Paradox's IPs remain the forefront of grand strategy for years to come. My name's Riemann, and until next time, thanks for watching.